My name is Logan Tapman, and we're going to be discussing biases, heuristics, and decision making. So as far as the content goes, we're going to be discussing three different sources that I looked at. Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics, and Biases by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. Thinking Fast and Slow, another work by Daniel Kahneman, and Why Heuristics Work, a piece by Greg Geigerinzer. Following that, we're going to have a brief discussion, recap of the main takeaways, as, far as, as well as a reflection on heuristics in my own life with an example for my personal business dealings. First, we're going to be looking at judgment under uncertainty, heuristics, and biases. So, uh, the paper was written by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman in the Journal of Science in 1974. While we discussed Daniel Kahneman later on in the background for thinking fast and slow, Amos Tversky was a psychologist with a background in cognitive science and behavioral economics. He worked for Stanford until he passed away in 1996. Uh, he worked with Daniel Kahneman for years, and they went on to develop prospect theory which won a Nobel Prize in 2002 in economics uh, that Daniel Kahneman was awarded. Um, but Kahneman has came out recently, or since then, and said that he would have never gotten that with Amos, without Amos Tversky, so it really was a two-person award. The two were great friends, as you can see here in the picture on the right. The main idea of this paper is that we should be cautious of heuristic pitfalls and uh, the potential harm that they can have. So uh, the paper is laid out describing heuristics and then following up with three examples of the primary models of heuristics. Uh, so representativeness bias, availability bias, and anchoring bias are, are three of the primary heuristics that are used in day-to-day -day life, at least in, when this paper was written in 1974. So what is a heuristic in the first place? A heuristic is really uh, could be understood as an intuition or a way that we break down a complica or complex question into a judgment question that is much simpler using our intuition, our experiences, our uh, past successes and failures. Um, these are two quotes that I think are really useful uh, to understanding it. Uh, specifically this first one when it says, uh, heuristic principles which reduce the complex tasks of assessing probabilities and predicting values to simpler judgmental operations. Uh, later on they also are quoted describing it, uh, heuristics as a repertoire of intuitions with which we can use to make decisions about complex problems using our own understanding. So there's t different types of heuristics, and we're going to look at three of them, the first one being representativeness. So what is representative bias? Well, a quote from the paper that describes it fairly well. Uh, what is the probability that object A belongs to class B? So whenever we're faced with a complicated problem where we have to make some kind of understanding on object A, instead of trying to figure out the solution to that question, we ask ourselves another question, which is basically, does this other example that I've seen in my life represent this question that I'm now faced with? Um, does class A belong to class B, or does object A belong to class B? And so can I make a decision based off of their relationship or how well uh, B represents A? So there's several specific cases, but one example that is given by the authors in the paper is of this good neighbor, Steve. So if the, your good neighbor, Steve, is described as the following, shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful, meek and tidy, has a need for order and structure, then um, you are asked, given that information, what do you think is a likely uh, occupation for Steve? If you're like me, you would probably look at that description and say, well, between these five options, there's a good chance that he's a librarian. If these are the only five possibilities, there's a good chance he's a librarian, because that sounds like a lot of the librarians that I've seen in my life, that description. Well, in reality, the question I'm forgetting to ask myself when I'm trying to guess what is Steve's likely position or occupation, I'm forgetting to ask myself other important questions that have to be asked, such as, what are the highest probability jobs already in existence? So as it turned out in the example, Steve is a farmer. Even though he looks like a librarian, we're asking ourselves, does he look like a librarian? Does he belong to class B? Uh, that's not really the answer that we're looking for. We're not looking for the answer that A belongs to B. We're looking for some other uh, answer to a different question that we're not asking because instead we're using this heuristic incorrectly. So that is representativeness. Availability then, another quote that describes availability is, there are situations in which people assess the frequency of a class or the probability of an event by the ease with which instances or occurrences can be brought to mind. So uh, there's again, several simple cases of this, but an example would be, um, if you know a lot of people who have heart attacks or have had cancer or some other illness, um, you probably think there's a higher likelihood that those illnesses occur than somebody who's never been around somebody that that's happened to. 
this is just us replacing the question of how likely is some event or what is the chance of some event with how easy is it to re for me to recall occurrences of that event in my life. Finally, the last heuristic that people use often is anchoring. So in many situations, people make estimates by starting from an initial value that is adjusted to yield the final answer. Again, several subcases, but one example that I apologize, I don't know why I had such a hard time with the grammar in this, is uh, goes as follows. There are redwood trees that are 180 feet tall. Now, given that information, what do you think is the world record redwood tree? Well, if you said something close to 180, you fall in victim to anchoring bias, and that is because 180 is the first number that you heard. Uh, and so you anchored that number instead of coming up with something based off of a more complicated uh, solution process. The true world record redwood tree is about 300 feet tall, at least. I don't remember the specific number, but uh, this would be an example of anchoring bias. This can be seen in a number of different places, but for our intents and purposes, this is the example. Uh, that is That wraps up the three specific examples of heuristics that are covered in that paper and kind of wraps up that paper as well. Um, from there, we're going to move into Thinking Fast and Slow, which is a book written by Daniel Kahneman some 20 or some uh, 40 years after writing this original paper. Um, and this one dives into a few more aspects of heuristics and decision making as individuals than the paper does. So the book was written in 2011 by Daniel Kahneman. Um, his background, again, as we said earlier, is in psychology. Uh, and he did win that Nobel Prize in Economic Science alongside Amos Tversky, although he was the one that uh, was awarded it. He still is a professor at Princeton University, is alive and well. I, I believe he's 94 now. Um, and he still teaches psychology. Uh, the book was awarded numerous, numerous awards and is on many business lists as a miss, must read uh, for business minds and entrepreneurs moving forward. So this book can be divided into five primary sections, the two systems, heuristics and biases, overconfidence, choices, and two selves. And we're going to briefly touch on each of those. The first is the two systems. So the idea of the two systems is that humans have two primary systems of decision making that developed over different times of our ancestral timeline. System one would have been one of the very first systems developed in our mind, claims the authors. Um, system one would have been intuitive, uh, fast thinking. It would have been uh, almost instinctual. It wouldn't take a lot of energy. It would be based almost on gut feelings. It's quick and rapid. Yeah. Uh, it's based a lot off of experiences and recollections that uh, the decision maker has. System two, alternatively, is more recent, relatively newer to our ancestry, uh, supposedly. This system two would be thoughtful and slow. Uh, it's painstaking. It is deliberate. It uses a lot more energy to think through processes using logic and probability and these uh, skills that we have to break down complex problems and solve them methodically. Uh, while both systems have their advantages and their times and places to be used, uh, ideally they can work together to optimize the amount of energy you need to make in uh, making a decision as well as uh, the success of your decision. Ideally, you can make system one decisions when they are necessary and system two when they're necessary. So that way you're never spending more energy or getting incorrect answers based off of which system you're using. Uh, heuristics and biases discusses uh, heuristics and biases similar to the paper, um, judgment under uncertainty. And so we're not going to cover those specifics here, but you are more than welcome to read through the full report and see discussion of uh, heuristics and biases discussed in the paper or in the book by Daniel Kahneman. Overconfidence has a lot to do with the two systems. And so uh, in overconfidence, we learn we talk about two things primarily. Um, one is that people are lazy and they are also overconfident. And so oftentimes we are making decisions um, while being overconfident, at least the poor decision making. Uh, we don't stop and ask ourselves if we are using heuristics and if we are using heuristics, what presumptions and assumptions we are using. And oftentimes we think ourselves smarter than we are. Um, instead of taking painstaking, or ta painstaking slow processes to make sure we get to the right answer. Now, while it's not always a bad thing to use system one or to use heuristics to solve problems, it is a bad thing when we're using them incorrectly. And so we need to understand ourselves well enough to slow down and ask ourselves, what are we doing? What assumptions are we making? So that way we're not making bad decisions. Uh, one point that he makes is that we can often trust experts because their own intuition is is pretty developed for whatever system of, uh, that they're an expert over. 
And so for common problems, we can usually trust experts. But for specific complicated problems, it still shouldn't be something where we trust experts and expect no uh, deliberate problem solving in the process. Instead, we should we should go through a long and, and complicated, or a, we should a thorough, I should say, process of solving the problem. Uh, he also suggests addressing doubts often, early and often, to prevent overconfidence because when we are aware of the pitfalls of our decisions and our, our thinking, our process, uh, then we don't become overconfident because we know the problems associated. The next section discusses choices. And the main idea of this section is that people are, are risk averse. They do not want to lose. They don't like risk of loss in our decision making. That's how we are. We would prefer to not lose more than we prefer to win, even. Um, and that's just for typical people. Um, that relates, too, to our misjudgment of unlikely events. Oftentimes, we can give unlikely events more credit than they are due because we are afraid of them happening, when in reality, there's such low likelihood that they can't happen that we're giving them too much of a control over our life. Um, so, for an example, uh, Daniel Kahneman spent a lot of time in Israel. He is an ethnic Jew. Um, and while he was there in the uh, 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of fear over getting onto a bus because of recent Israeli bus bombings. Now, uh, Daniel Kahneman, Kahneman breaks down the likelihood of being involved in a bus bombing, and the likelihood was virtually zero. But that being said, because there was so much uh, prominence on the news, people were still worried. Um, if anything, it's availability bias that people were worried still. Uh, that bus bombings were happening more often than they were and they were too afraid to get on buses when in reality they had a almost 100% chance of being able to get on a bus and be safe because of the frequently or the frequent number of bus trips used every day in Israel. Finally, the last section discusses the two selves. The idea of the two selves is that we have a um, there, there's a difference in the way that we observe an event as it is occurring, this experiencing self and the way that we observe an event after it has occurred, or this remembering self. Um, so the two are related, but they're different. The way we experience something and the way we recall experiencing something are two different um, observations. And so happiness, uh, Daniel Kahneman claims, is a product of these two selves as well, um, and is based on both the way that we are experiencing and having had experienced events happening in our lives. And because of this, it's a very complicated process. So this last portion, uh, certainly more existential, but very interesting nonetheless. So uh, that concludes Thinking Fast and Slow. From here, we're going to discuss why heuristics work by Greg Geigerinzer. So uh, just some background on Greg Geigerinzer. Uh, first, this paper was written in the Journal of Perspectives on Psychological Science in 2008. Um, so just a few years older than Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, Geigerinzer's background is in decision making. Uh, he works at the University of Potsdam as a professor and is also involved with Simply Rational, the Institute of Decisions. So um, very involved in the field of decision making. From, he's, he is European and so, um, but nonetheless, a very uh, important figure today. Um, the idea for this paper is essentially that we should develop heuristics as a system, as a framework that we can use to make decisions moving forward because there's boundless benefits. Uh, so the summary of the main contents of this are models of heuristics, kind of the benefit of having a model of heuristics um, and, and the reasons why it could be good. Uh, from there, it's examples of heuristics or um, ways that heuristics already in society have demonstrated their promise and their value. And from there, uh, toward a science of heuristics, what would be the steps in the process in developing a model and what could be the benefits? So jumping in, models of heuristics, he essentially discusses these five different reasons where models of heuristics would be beneficial. Uh, as far as computational models, by developing computational models of heuristics, it, it increases our ability to um, understand and, and compare heuristics to logic-based models. Tractability, heuristics have benefit already inherently over logic and probability because of their ability to um, be trackable compared to things like um, an AI trying to decide every single possible move of a game of chess by using heuristics. We don't have to think that many steps ahead um, and we are able to keep on track of what we're doing. As far as robustness, heuristics are uh, naturally capable of um, avoiding being under or overfit. They are um, naturally capable of filtering out useless data. Um, 
and then evolved capacities and social environments. Again, we're just he's making cases for why heuristics are beneficial um, and using different uh, angles to make the different arguments to make his case. Um, jumping into examples of heuristics, this is really the the portion of the paper where Guy Garinzer provides the the potential benefits of heuristics. And so the Markowitz investment test, essentially there is this Nobel Prize award winning Markowitz who created a, a portfolio asset uh, allocation optimization uh, or an optimized portfolio asset allocation for investments. Uh, he came out, won an award, people thought it was profound. Uh, within the same year, um, somebody did a study and realized that if you took his optimized portfolio allocation of investments and compared it to a kind of rule of thumb, which would be dividing equal portions of your total investments um, across every single different investment you have. So if you have five different stocks, dividing your full amount of money to invest evenly across those five stocks, um, that being his example of the heuristic. They compared the uh, optimal allocation to this kind of rule of thumb allocation and saw that over a 500 year time span, uh, the heuristic one. And the reason why is because the optimal asset allocation is only able to look at past data and is not really able to um, predict future performance, while as the heuristic was able to be successful and um, was not uh, overtuned to prior data like the optimal method was. Um, the moral example he uses is actually discussing organ donors or organ donor rates. And so in the United States, Organ donor rates are much lower than the organ donor rates in France. They're closer to 20% compared to France is almost 100%. Um, Guy Grenzer asks himself, is there reason because France is a much more moral country than the United States? Well, no. In fact, it's because France is, um, by default, citizens are set to be organ donors, while in the United States you have to opt in. The heuristic then being that it is uh, usually you're going to see more turnout when people have to change from one group to the other. Um, and so his point in this moral example is that by being cautious and aware of the way that we are using heuristics and policy making, we would have moral impact or long-term health impact or impact at least on societal levels or on multiple societal levels. And so really we should be considering how can we develop um, policies and whatever it would be by considering heuristics because of the simple information that we can be aware of such as, wow, if we change um, from being an opt-in country to an opt-out country for organ donorship, we could see the amount of available organ donors increase tremendously just because of the change in verbiage of the policy, just by being thoughtful to the heuristics. So after giving some examples of the benefits, um, Guy Garinzer basically lays out his plan for how we could just begin to develop a framework. The idea would be that by using an adaptive toolbox where we are understanding basic heuristics, um, we are understanding background information well enough to decide or to, to choose a heuristic, breaking down heuristics into building blocks, and then from there using said heuristics and our awareness to create understanding of problems, um, we can create processes that take advantage of heuristics to solve um, difficult problems. We can design um, e heuristics or we can design um, solutions using heuristics. Uh, he gives an example of some physicians at Michigan at a hospital who used heuristic to develop a process of predicting heart attack likeliness that was more successful than many probability based models. Um, and the way they did that was by breaking down existing heuristics into um, new models that used the building blocks of those existing heuristics and their information that they had uh, as background information. Uh, so very interesting indeed. Um, very promising uh, way to develop new models and, and make decisions in the future. Uh, and a little bit different approach than Kahneman and Tversky, or at least consideration. Um, so now we're going to look at some of the main takeaways. Um, one of the biggest takeaways, obviously, is the two systems of judgment. Uh, humans making judgment with both uh, painstaking long processes that are uh, energy requiring and uh, are often not done properly because we're lazy and systems that are quick and intuitive and instinctual that we prefer to use because it takes such little amounts of energy. Uh, heuristics then are what bridges system one solutions to these system two problems um, by turning a system two problem into a less complicated problem that can be solved using judgment. Uh, and of course again our laziness and our overconfidence are directly related. 
um, if we understand that we are lazy and overconfident instead of um, being lazy and overconfident unknowingly and resulting in incorrect solutions uh, we can tune ourselves to say okay I know that I naturally want to be lazy uh, and I also know that I usually think my predictions are correct um, when I'm using heuristics Instead, I'm going to make sure, sure that, that I set up cues and processes for myself to avoid just being lazy, to avoid using heuristics uncorrectly or incorrectly, and to avoid um, coming up with solutions that don't actually solve the correct problem. Uh, it's a huge takeaway to understand our laziness and overconfidence so that we can prevent it. Uh, another thing that I think was profound was the idea of a repertoire of intuition. Um, it's important for us to understand that heuristics come from our own intuition and so all the more reason, as I say a couple points later, it's important to build that foundation of understanding problems before we begin using any kind of judgment calls or intuition or gut calls to make decisions. Um, we should really build our intuition if we plan to use heuristics in whatever field it would be. Uh, the reality that heuristics are not restricted to lay people, of course, is significant as well. I think as somebody with college education, especially graduate education, it is easy to feel a little bit confident in myself more so than necessary. Um, and the point of this is to say, hey, I need to be aware that I also can use these shortcuts, um, and they can be beneficial. Um, as somebody with more education and more background and understand problems fully, it can be beneficial, but it can also be very harmful if I think myself correct and use shortcuts that aren't proper, uh, useful. There is as overall potential pitfalls and potential progress associated with using heuristics. So finally, I'm going to look at an example of heuristics that I use in my own life, um, and, uh, and from that we'll conclude. And so I invest in real estate in my local area. Um, one of the things, things I do when I invest in real estate, however, is I usually don't look at neighborhoods that I think in my mind are a quote-unquote bad neighborhood. I just don't look at the properties that go on sale. I don't usually consider would that be a good investment or not. Um, my understanding of what is a quote-unquote bad neighborhood is also not exhaustive or thoroughly. It more so comes from my background, from my, um, my understanding of nearby neighborhoods, uh, my experiences, and... Um, uh, sort of some, some of my environmental upbringing as well. And so there's pros and cons associated to avoiding bad neighborhoods, um, but the biggest problem is that I'm, there's, there's a loss. There's a, a, a loss in not being able to invest in properties that could be potentially good investments just because I'm not even looking at them in the first place. Uh, the question I should be answering whenever a property comes on the MLS that I'm able to see is, is the property a good investment? The question I am answering instead, though, is, is, is this property in a good neighborhood? Is this instance of a class, uh, or is this instance of an object belonging to a class of a good neighborhood? Um, and by rearranging my thoughts a little bit, by setting up cues in a system that's aware of my own laziness, um, I could start answering the question instead, are crime rates and rental populations in this neighborhood better than a given threshold value? By doing this, I'm still enabling myself to be quick and efficient and problem solving. I'm also um, keeping myself from avoiding things from this, uh, you know, stereotyping to a bad, quote unquote, bad neighborhood. And instead, I get to look at a property and answer the question: Would this be a good investment? Instead, is this just a good neighborhood? This way, I'm taking in the information on the quality of the neighborhood too, and I'm using that to help me make a judgment on the quality of the investment overall. So this is just an example of where I see myself using representativeness bias as a heuristic in my own business life in a way that I think from I've learned from this research that I can certainly improve that in the future. That is the conclusion of the report. Here are my references. I appreciate your time very much for watching the video. If you have any comments or thoughts or concerns, please leave them in the comments below. But again, thank you very much and above all, have a wonderful day.